morning. The message is out of Psalm 93. Now, if we've been preaching through the summer Psalms, Alex had said, Hey, I put you down for Psalm 93, but if you want to change it, feel free. And I said, Alex, it's five verses. that talks about God's reign over creation, our storms and eternity. I think I'll preach that. Oh, man. that good. I think I'll stay there. And I'm excited to preach in Psalm 93 this morning. It, it's a really good Psalm. It's only five verses, but it's packed full. It's packed very full. So if I was to ask you this morning, who was the greatest king to ever live? Who would you say? King Jesus. Now, if I was to ask you, who was the greatest earthly king to ever live? Who would you say? David. King David lived for 70 years. He died in 970 BC. He reigned as a king for 40 years. King Solomon lived... To be around 60 to 80 years old, died 931 BC. He reigned also for 40 years. Now, I like to Google those questions. Not that I always agree with Google, but I Googled who was the greatest king in the old times. They said it was Cyrus, the king of Persia. He lived to be around 50 to 60 years old. He was known as Cyrus the Great. That is the same Cyrus that we just got out of in the book of Ezra. He reigned for 29 years and he was killed in battle. See, Israel and Judah had over 44 kings in the Old Testament. Some who reigned for a year or two, some who reigned for many decades. And the crazy thing is when you started reading about all the kings, they all didn't serve God. Very few of them were actually faithful to God. One commentator said that the worst ones served Baal. And that most of them were adulterers. Why is this important this morning? Because in Psalm 93, this is a royal psalm. And it is about the greatest king that ever was, that ever is, and that will ever forever be. Amen. And that is our king, Jesus. Worldly kings will come and go. They will die. They will be defeated. Some of them won't even be remembered. But not our king. He is the king of kings. He is our king. See, nine, Psalm 93 states in an opening sentence, it says, the Lord reigns. And we're going to read it in a minute. It says, the Lord reigns. That's its opening line. The Lord reigns. It doesn't say that our Lord reigned for a brief period of time. It, he reigns when he wants to reign. It says that our Lord reigns. And Psalm 93 reminds us and teaches us that our Lord has always reigned. From before the world existed, before creation came forth, before he spoke into action, our God reigned. Our Lord reigns now today. Amen. Even in the midst of our storms, he is still reigning. And our Lord will reign forevermore where there will be no end to it. See, scholars don't know who wrote Psalm 93. We're going to clarify that early. We don't know who wrote Psalm 93. We don't even know exact time that it was written. So we always like to focus and be in God's word, know who it was written to, why it was written to them, and get the context of it. But we don't know who wrote it, and we don't know the time it was written. But what we do know is we can focus on who it's about, and it's about our Lord, 
It's about King Jesus. It's about our God. It's about how he reigned in the beginning, how he reigns now, and how he will reign forevermore. So as we unpack our sermon this morning, that's going to be our three points. Verses 1 and 2 will be in the beginning, our Lord reigned. Verses 3 and 4 will be in our storms, our Lord is reigning. And verse 5 will be our Lord reigns forevermore. If you would, please, let's stand for the reading of Psalm 93 together. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lifted up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters. Mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Let us pray, church. Father, we just pray for your word this morning. This is your psalm. This psalm is about you. Father, I am not worthy to stand here and preach your word. Apart from you, I would not be worthy. You are the only good thing that we have. You are good. You are great. Your psalm this morning says that. It talks about your royalty, your greatness. So, Father, I pray that your word would be working this morning. Yes. Our church is going through a time of suffering. It has been known present this morning, started in our prayer service. Today, we're going to hear in your word that you're present in our suffering. So, Father, I pray that you stay at work, that you don't stop. That as your word is preached, you work mightily. Because you are mightier than any storm, any suffering that will come our way. Lord, I pray that I would just be your vessel. And you, your words would come out, would be from you. Yes. And that your church would be here to listen, Lord. Amen. And would take in your words, not mine. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Verses 1 and 2. Oh, these are powerful two verses. To be honest, I could have camped out here for 30 minutes. I could have stayed right here in the part where it says, The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt, yet the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from old. You are from everlasting. The main point I got out of Psalm 93 is our Lord's reign is from everlasting to everlasting. There was no beginning and there will be no end and it is present now. In verse 1, the author states how great the reign of our Lord is. He brings the point twice here that the Lord is robed. He is robed in majesty and he is robed in strength. See, in the culture, when Psalms were written, a king's robe showed how magnificent a king was. A king's robe would show his authority. It would show his wealth. It would show his power. Verse 1 states that our Lord is robed in majesty. What does that look like, church? What does it look like that our Lord is robed in majesty? What does majesty here mean? The definition of majesty in this context, in the original language, is greatness. Our Lord is robed in greatness. Our Lord is robed in dignity. I was reading an article on this, Psalm 93, uh, from a guy who wrote it. and He said, I never knew the depth of God's majesty until I saw it so clear. Stranded in the middle of the Pacific Ocean with no lights for hundreds and hundreds of miles, I had nothing to do that night but to look up at the stars. And that night I stood and I stared at the stars and billions and billions I had never seen before. And it hit me. God put them there. God put them there. And it put him in awe of the majesty of God. God created those very stars. And it was endless to count. Have you ever seen something in creation that just makes you stop in awe and admire its beauty? Admire its majesty? Admire its greatness? Has anyone ever been to the Grand Canyon? To the Alaskan mountains? To the redwood trees that are out west that are hundreds of feet tall. Niagara Falls, I know that one's a yes. What about a creek in the mountain that just never quits flowing? A field full of wildflowers. You sit there and watch them sway with the wind. A fresh snow that covers the ground that is just so pure white. Snorkeling on a coral reef. 
If you've ever been 30 miles, 40 miles out in the ocean or even farther, you get the vast size of it and it just puts you in awe. Countless waterfalls. The truth is, I could go on and on and on about all the things in creation that shares the majesty of who our God is, couldn't I? It's endless because he created it. And when you get into those things that bring all in creation and you're looking at them and you're admiring their beauty, do the storms of life just kind of dissipate a little bit for a while? You kind of forget about everything. You, you forget about your worries because you're so captivated in the beauty of God's creation. And our God is robed in majesty. He created it. I was thinking, man, I, I was so captivated by the coral reefs that I forgot there was things in there that could eat me. <laughs> there was. We jumped in the water and looked 30 foot down. I'm like, there's three sharks waiting for me. Have you ever thought what the Lord of our robe looks like? How beautiful it is. I think creation helps us see it a little bit, but I think it's only a small glimpse. That's my belief. How majestic is our Lord's robe? How great is it? Isaiah spoke about it in Isaiah 6. He described it as it filled the temple, just the trail of it. The train of the Lord's robe filled the temple. And when he saw it, when he saw who the Lord was, he was brought to repentance by it. That's how much all there is. He said, woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So how majestic is our Lord's robe? How majestic is it, church? I think we get a small glimpse. I think our mind can run wild with thinking how majestic it's going to be. One day we'll see it. That's what we know. But here's what captivated me when I was studying on this psalm. The Lord robe carries majesty, but it also carries power and authority. The amazing thing is how Jesus, our Lord, left his robe of majesty and came and humbled himself to take on an outer garment. Our Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty, but I could not connect Jesus here. See, Isaiah 53, 1 says, for he grew up before him like a young plant. Like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Speaking directly to Jesus coming. See, Jesus was fully God while being fully man when he was here on earth. We talked about this yesterday in our men's breakfast. And I loved it because I was like, oh, I'm preparing for that. God, Jesus, we, I think Alex had said, God, Jesus wasn't half God, half man. He's fully God. He was fully man. And I've always wondered... What the robe looks like that God wears in heaven. How majestic is it? But then it made me ponder, what did Jesus' robe look like here on earth? What did his robe look like here on earth? Because he left majesty to come here for you and I to rescue us. Do you think when he came here and he put on his outer garment, his outer robe, do you think it was majestic? Isaiah 53, 1 tells us no. Was it dirty? Was it stained with blood? Was it stained with tears? Probably. Was it worthy for a king to wear? The garment that Jesus put on, the robe that he put on when he was here on earth. Was it worthy for a king to wear? The woman who had bled for 12 years, she had faith though. She knew if she just touched his outer garment, she would be healed. And I wondered what that outer garment looked like because it had no beauty or majesty. It was stained with dirt. It was stained with mud. He didn't go to the Carlton Ritz every night and take his white robe off and put it in the laundry and get it bleached every day. It was dirty. And it made me in awe that God left, that Jesus left heaven and took off that robe of majesty to put it on a robe of filth for you and I. It's crazy, isn't it? Why would God do this? Why would God do that? Because he loves us. He wants to redeem us and bring us back. It is his will. We'll see that later on in this text. The second part of verse 1 says, He has put on strength as his belt. Yet the world is established. It shall never be moved. Church, this part is very beautiful. It connects how great our Lord's reign is from the beginning. It connects the beginning of time. The world is established. He has put on strength as his belt. Well, we have to unpack that. What is the strength of belt? What are you and I told to put on as our strength and belt? Ephesians, we are instructed to put on the whole armor of God, right? 
put on the armor that is the belt of truth. Where do we find our Lord's truth? We find it in his word. Where do we find in his word? Who is his word? Jesus is his word. John 1, 1 through 1, 3 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything that was made. The word was and is Christ, you church. Where do we see the Lord's strength? Everywhere. But we see it in his word, do we not? We see the Lord's strength in his word. He put on strength as a belt. And how powerful is the word of God today? How powerful is the word of God? It's transforming lives. It's saving people from hell. It's taking them to eternity. God is working through his word. His word is powerful. He has put it on. And this world was established. Our God reigned in creation and this world was established. It shall never be moved. See, God spoke this world into existence. How powerful is that? How powerful is God's word that he spoke into existence, the beautiful things we just talked about, that he spoke us into existence, and he took dirt and made man. He spoke everything we see in creation into existence. Is that not powerful? Oh, that's so powerful. I'll apologize, but not. If you came here believing today that this world came into existence by an explosion and out came perfection, I'm sorry, that is not what the truth is. This world came because God spoke it into existence. Because he reigned before this world even existed. He spoke it into existence. The truth in verse 1 and verse 2 is our Lord reigned before the foundations of this world was even laid. That our Lord spoke it in creation through his word and that Christ was there with him. That's why I wanted to connect John 1, 1 through 3. Because Christ was there. He was there. He is the word and nothing was made that wasn't made through him. Our Lord's reign didn't have a beginning. It was from everlasting is what scripture tells us. It did not have a beginning. It was from everlasting. Christ did not have a beginning because he was from everlasting and is from everlasting. God created everything that exists. How majestic is that? How great is that? Think about it. When you walk out today and you look at the trees, he created them. When you look at the sky and you see the clouds that roll by, he created them. I believe if we could just spend a day admiring God's beauty, I think I'll wait till February when it cools off. <laughs> we can just be captivated by all of God's creation. Verse 2 says, your throne is established. From of old, you were from everlasting. That part is important in our theology. Your throne is established from of old. Before anything was created, you are from everlasting. Saying that he had no beginning. He has always been. I love Psalm 90 verse 2. It's a prayer from Moses. Before the mountains were brought forth or forever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting you are God. I love that church. See, our God reigned before the world existing. Our Lord created everything by his word. And where do we see his majesty? We see it in his greatness, his creation. We see his strength in his creation. Is there strength in his creation? Think about it. Is there strength in God's creation? It said this world should never be moved. I know this could go many ways in deciphering this, but I was thinking about Think about that. When God spoke this world to start spinning, has it ever stopped? He spoke it to spin. And this earth keeps spinning over and over and over, day in and day out for thousands and thousands of years. But what would happen if it stopped spinning? Has anyone ever questioned that? What would happen if this world just suddenly stopped spinning? I took this from the Smithsonian website. It says, at the equator, the earth's rotational motion is at its fastest about a thousand miles an hour in a rotation. Anyone ever gone a thousand miles an hour? You're close to it right now and you don't even know it. It said, if that motion suddenly stopped, the mountains would send things flying eastward, moving rocks and oceans and trigger earthquake and tsunamis. The still moving atmosphere would scour landscapes and be complete destruction of the world. And our God spoke it into existence and his strength keeps it going. It is all by him. I'm just amazed by that. What if our world tilted a little bit? 
Well, if we moved a few degrees one way, we might freeze to death. If we move a few degrees the other way, the summer felt like we did, we might heat to death. It's a good thing our God is still reigning, is it not? Yes. He is still reigning. He reigned in the beginning of creation. He is still reigning today, and he keeps everything held together. If he didn't, what hope would we have? And that leads us into our second point, probably my most excited point, especially after our prayer service. In the storms, our Lord is reigning. In the storms, our Lord is reigning. Let's unpack verses 3 and 4. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods have lifted up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders and mighty of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. We saw God's power in creation, just a glimpse of it in creation, but we need to see now his power in our lives. We need to see his rule and reign in our lives now. Verses 3 and 4 helps us unpack that. See, we don't know when this was exactly written, but it is believed to be in time of the Canaanites. In a time when the people worshipped Baal and they didn't worship God. But the people at the time believed that Baal was also the God of the sea. And that when they would anger Baal, that the seas would roar. They feared the rage of the sea and the rise of the floods because it brought forth destruction and it brought forth death. Therefore, they feared angering the fake God that they served, Baal. They feared that the storms would come and it would destroy them. It's a good thing we don't battle that in our life, right? Anyone, we asked earlier, anyone not suffering today? Anyone not going through a storm? Storms hit hard. Wave after wave, they come. If you've ever been on the beach on a rough day, it's like one wave ends, the next one hits you. Sometimes you don't even see it. It just hits you from behind and tumbles you into the sand. And I was thinking, man, I've been out in the ocean. I've been like eight, 10 foot seas. I was like, wonder what the biggest wave ever was recorded. I don't know if this is true or not, but it says a tsunami, a tsunami hit Alaska in 1958 with a 1,720 foot tall wave. The Empire State Building is only 1,250 foot tall. Kind of help you understand a little bit how big that would be. Waves 30 foot tall and tsunamis have wiped out countries, killing thousands and twenties and thirty thousands of people. I've been out fishing in the ocean. I love it. And I've been out there in eight to ten foot seas in a thirty foot boat. Not mine. I don't have one that big. We chartered and went out. And I'm telling you, you get out there in eight to ten foot seas, it'll make you question your relationship with God. Where am I at, Lord? Because I might be coming to see you really soon. But you get out in those big rough waves and there's just one after the other after the other. And all of a sudden a side one hits you and it tosses you around. I couldn't imagine a 60 foot wave, a 30 foot wave, or a 1700 foot wave. But why is this important? Because in our lives we will have storms, will we not? They will rage from time to time. The waves will get bigger. As it says here in verses 3 and 4, the flood waters will rise and the waves will beat us up. Do we remember how our Lord's majesty is, his greatness? The psalmist states another fact here, church. He says, though the floods might rise, though the floods might roar, though the thunder may come, though the seas will rage, our Lord on high is mightier. There is truth in that church, and we can stand firm on that. You see, when the floods rise in our lives, when the storms come, we can stand firm. Why? Because our God is mightier. Amen. It is only because our Lord is mightier and it is only because he is still reigning that we can stand these storms of life. We can be sure of his word, church. He is mightier than any storm that we will ever face in this world. We can stand firm on that. There's truth in that. But we still struggle, do we not? Does anyone enjoy when a storm comes in life? Does anyone enjoy when the seas rage and we feel beat up? No. We feel like that little dinghy boat out on the ocean getting tossed from side to side. And it makes our faith wobble because we're getting hit from every side. We're not alone in that church. We're not alone. God doesn't put us in a sea of life and put us out there and we're getting impacted and he leaves us alone. He's there with us. And he is mightier than them. Remember in Luke chapter 8 when we walked through the book of Luke? When Jesus got on a boat and went across the, the sea and the storms raged at night, 
It's in verses 22 through 25. He says, one day he got on a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out. And as they sailed, he fell asleep and a windstorm came down in the lake and they were filling with water and in danger. And they went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he woke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves and they ceased and there was a calm. Sounds like the same Jesus in Psalm 93. And he said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid and they marveled, said to one another, who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water and they obey him? Sound like the same God in Psalm 93 we just read about? See, when the storms hit, the disciples panicked. This fear of perishing set in. I'm glad we don't suffer with that. That is not true. When storms hit, we panic. We fear that we're going to perish, that we're, God's not going to save us. We just fear. But not Jesus. He's in this boat, and the winds are about to come, and the storms are about to come, and it's going to get rough. And what did he do? He went and took a nap. I like that. He went and took a nap. He found rest in the storm. I've always pictured when I study this passage in Luke, I've always pictured the disciples walking up to Jesus at the back of the boat with a bucket in their hand going, get up and help us bail water. We're perishing. Do you not care? Get up and help me bail water so we don't sink. In our storms of life, do we respond that same way to God? Do we go to God in the same response? Do you not care? Get up and help me bail water. Or do we forget what Psalm 93 said, that he is mightier than any storm, that he is mightier than any wave. When the water raises and the seas rage in our storms of life, do we forget that God is still reigning? We do. And we go to God in panic with a bucket in our hand, begging him to help us bail water. And we forget that he is capable of calming the storm just by speaking to it. We get this feeling that we're all alone and no one cares, do we not? When we're battling storms, do you feel like no one cares? I'm all alone. That's an attack from the enemy, to be honest. He wants us to feel all alone because he wants to feel like no one cares. So I'm going to ask you this morning to do something difficult. Might be a little bit out of your comfort zone. I told Alex, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to do this. I said, but after the prayer service, I'm doing it. Are you battling a storm right now in your life? Have you been ba battling a storm? Are you asking Jesus to help you bail water? Or are you asking him to calm the storm and give you peace and comfort during the storm? Which one are you doing? Which one are you doing? If you're battling a storm right now, I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to ask you to, in faith, stand up. Are you alone? God is with us. He is still reigning. And look around at your brothers and sisters who are standing. Because we're all in a storm of life on this side of eternity. All of us. I'm standing too. If I was sitting, I would have stood up right away too. Every one of us is battling a storm. So now I'm going to ask you to go a little bit more and break our comfort. I'm going to ask someone, if they're at morning prayer this morning, to raise your hand. Now I'm going to ask the church to gather around those people and pray for them. If you would, come up front if you raised your hand. Let's just pause for a moment and have a time of prayer. And church, I'm going to ask you to come and pray for them. Psalm 93, 4 states that our Lord is mightier than any storm. He is mightier than any flood and mightier than any way that will hit us. In John 16, 33, Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Church, will you pray for one another this morning?
Father, I thank you for those who just came forward to openly admit that we're not perfect, that we're suffering, that we're going through storms. Father, I pray they would trust in you. I would pray they put their hope in you. And they know their storms might be hard, but you are mightier. Though these storms might be rough, you are mightier. And that you are there with them, that you never leave them nor abandon them. Thank you for the church to gather around and pray, Lord. It is one way we share, as we were in our prayer service this morning, we share in suffering and we share in comfort. We comfort one another in your word and in by prayer. Thank you for those who came forward to pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God, God is still reigning today. In our storms, he has not taken a break. He has not taken a nap. He has not gone to the bathroom. He has not gone to sleep or gone on vacation. He is still ruling and reigning today in our storms. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Tomorrow he will be the same. The next day he will be the same. And for eternity he will be the same. And our Lord will reign forevermore. Verse 5, our third point. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. The author states here that God's decrees are not just trustworthy, but he adds an adverb there. He says they are very trustworthy. They are very trustworthy. And how long? Forevermore. Amen. There is no end. What a truth a statement. Your decrees, your testimonies, your will is trustworthy. See, when a king makes a decree, there is to be trust that that decree will come to be complete, right? Earthly kings will fail there, but our king is not an earthly king. He is a heavenly king and he is the king of kings. He will not fail us, church. 
The decrees he makes are trustworthy, very trustworthy. Who can we trust more than Jesus? So what is a decree from God? What is a decree from Jesus, our King? I was kind of baffled by this. I thought, man, well, the decrees are his promises that he's going to come again, that we will be with him one day in eternity, that sickness nor death will separate us from the love of God. All those are decrees from God. And I got to thinking and I watched this 15 minute word lab from John Piper. I love those. And he focused on the decree is God's will. And it's hard to give you all the decrees because I'd have to start in Genesis and go through Revelation. Because God's decree is his will be done. We prayed it this morning. Your kingdom come, your will be done. God's decree is his will. Romans 12, 12 tells us, don't be confirmed by this world, but transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by the testing, you may discern what is the will of God. What is good, acceptable, and perfect. Ephesians 5, 17, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Colossians 1, 9 and so from the day we heard, we not seek to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Romans 15, 32, then by the will of God, I will come to you with a joyful heart and will be encouragement to one another. God's will is his decree. And what is God's will? What is God's will? Kind of, Puts a little bit of it in this verse. Are we to be a house of God? Is it his will that we're a house of God? That we're a house of prayer? Not this building, but our lives. We pray for the will to be done. For God's will to be done. That's what we pray for. But what is God's will? What was the will of the Lord from the beginning? And what will the will of the Lord be in the end? What is God's will from the beginning? And what will it be at the end? Because that's what the Bible is. It's from the beginning to the end. And it's a redemptive story about men, about us, how we have sinned against the holy God. And he has restored us. He has brought us into a sinless life. He has taken away our sins so that we could dwell with him. That is God's will that we sinners would one day dwell with the Lord Almighty. God's will was brought to completion on the cross, was it not? Jesus prayed. He said, not my will, Father, but your will. Go back to the fully man of Jesus. He wanted another way, did he not? The fully man of Jesus said, is there any other way? And he said, no, there's not. Not my will, Father, but yours. Jesus knew the will of God. And the will of God was for you and I to be restored back to God, to be with him eternity because he's going to reign forevermore. And so Jesus knew the only way was through his blood. Christ was not defeated on the cross, was he not, church? Death could not defeat God's will. That is the same for you and I today. We battle storms in life, but we can stand firm, and especially like Romans 8, nothing will separate us from the love of God. It is God's will that we will be with him for eternity, and he will reign forevermore. And his decrees are trustworthy and true. What is going to stop it? What king is going to challenge our King Jesus and prevail? We see it in Revelation, there will be some attempts, but he will win. And we know that. Revelation eleven fifteen 15 says, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Forever and ever. Church, do you believe that that decree is trustworthy and true? Do you believe that that is trustworthy and true? Amen. Scripture here said, since holiness befits his house and we are his house, we are a house of prayer. Can we say that corporately? Worship team is going to join me on the stage and just play quietly along with me. But I'm going to have another time of prayer. If we're to be a house of prayer, is there too much prayer for the church? So I'm going to lead you like we do in our prayer service. They're going to put up on the screen. Lord, because your decrees are trustworthy and true, I can trust. And I want you to fill in the blank. Stand, speak loudly, but I want you to fill in the blank, church. Will you pray that with me? Lord, because your decrees are trustworthy and true, I can trust. And fill in the blank, please. 
Would you please stand? Lord, because your decrees are trustworthy and true, I can trust that your will will be done. Not my will, but your will. I can trust from the beginning of all creation that you reigned and that you reign now in the storms of this life. And I can trust that you would be the one to deliver us. And one day we will stand before you holy and blameless, not because of our good works, but because of the cross. Because you left that robe of majesty and come and took on a robe of a servant and took our place on the cross. Your decree is trustworthy and true. And we can be with you forever and ever and ever because you reign and you will reign for now and forever. So Lord, help us to do this in prayer to you. Help us to stand here and claim that your decrees are trustworthy and that we can trust in you together, Lord. Help us as a church do that.